Hello and welcome to the Make It Conscious podcast. This is episode nine. And today I'm going to be talking about the exit and recovery process from exploitation. This is relevant whether we're talking about a relationship with a narcissist or uh, an exploitative cult situation or even a job where you're being exploited or even a much larger scale system of exploitation such as tyrannical governments and this kind of thing. This, what I'm going to share with you here, can be applied by people in all of those situations. Now, of course, this is not the last word on recovery from abuse. Uh, there's a, a vast topic of discussion here. But the idea it here is to give you a formula, really, and just to share some of the key elements and components of recovery from exploitative abuse in all of its forms. So we're talking here about where there's been dishonesty, where there has been undue influence. We can look to Stephen Hassan's bite model as a guide for what kind of behaviours that might be. So where there's been behavioural control of any kind, like physically forcing or even violence, where there's been information control, trying to perhaps prevent access to certain kinds of information, whether it's an abusive partner who's trying to hide things from you. And certainly this also includes any act of deception, misdirection, lying, all of this stuff. And then we've got any kind of thought control, whether there's a bit of techniques employed perhaps, or rationalizations to try and gaslight you, this kind of thing. And then of course, emotional control. So all these forms of under influence, they certainly overlap, but this can certainly be, be applied here, what I'm about to share, to any situation where there's been undue influence of any kind. So the title of today's episode is the Exit and Recovery Process from Exploitative Situations. For those of you that know, I have released a ebook relating to cult recovery. So that's called The Cult Recovery Guide. You can check that out on my website, makeitconscious.com forward slash free guide. But really, the principles that I share in there are very much applicable to any form of abusive relationship, no matter on what scale, whether we're talking about individual, whether we're talking about an organizational level, or whether we're even talking about societal. Now, you know, as you walk down this individuation road, uh, it becomes more and more apparently clear that these kinds of abuse techniques are being employed at all levels and that the kind of person to get involved in them is no kind of person, right? Every kind of person can find themselves in an exploitative situation. There's no particular kind of person, for example, that will join a cult or that will partner up with a narcissist unrealizing of their true intentions. But it may say something about the com composition of your own mind if you find yourselves in these situations repeatedly and noticing them and learning from them moving on. What you do notice as well is that many, many people never notice. And it's not that they don't get involved with these people. I mean, God knows that there's abuse happening at all levels, as I said. And, and the majority of people, frankly, just don't seem aware of any form of uh, undue influence being employed. If anything, the fact that you got close to an individual like this, I think can be construed as a source of strength. The true sage is a student of evil, of course, and you know, our unconscious mind will often try and put, put us close to vampiristic, psychopathic, narcissistic types as a way for us to develop into who we're truly capable of being. So as I said in the last episode, which was on the five phases of cult codependency, that you can turn the stereotype around these things 180 degrees. And in truth... The minority are those that have chosen to break free of these kinds of dynamics and that are very, very in tune to psychic control. And that actually the majority are both partaking in and on the receiving end of psychological abuse day in, day out. I and mean, it forms the basis of much of the corporate world, certainly not all of it. There's, uh, you know, there's nothing inherently bad or unwholesome about you know groups of people getting together and working towards a common goal. That's certainly not what I'm saying here. But it does just seem to happen that 
the majority of these organizations are absolutely rife with undue influence, deceptive behavior, saying one thing, doing another, conflict abound, aggressive competition, backstabbing, manipulating, schmoozing, putting on a mask. You know, this is by and large just the way things are done. Certainly the companies that I've worked for and known, this was pretty much um, just across the board. And by the last one that I worked for, I was just, I scratched my head like, hang on a second, am I, am I the only person who's seeing this? Uh, and I was one of the few, um, to be honest. So yeah, this is not some esoteric thing that just occurs like on the random peripherals of society. This is how a lot of modern society in its you know, spiral dynamics, red, blue and orange kind of <laughs> mindset it's how it's run a lot of the time, right? It's it's quite power oriented. If it's not power oriented, it's very absolutist. If it's not absolutist, it cares about typically one metric and one thing only, and that is, you know, the bottom line or how it advances me. Completely unknowing of the true harm that does to oneself and to others. And so there's glimmers now of a a slightly more sophisticated approach, and there's a lot of talk of inclusion and humanity uh, but to the point where kindness is sort of being mandated and you know that is um, merely another stepping stone along the same process of one-sided and naive approaches to the way of getting things done because if we're just telling each other to be to be kind and nice and you know uh, don't be a narcissist. Well, guess what? There's a lot of people in our society that don't speak that language and will jump on that and use it as a opportunity to exploit. Again, unknowing of a better way, unknowing of alternatives they could pursue that would improve their own lives and the lives of others. But that's the journey they're on, right? And we cannot be responsible for anyone else. We can only take responsibility for our own mind, cultivate wholesome intentions, and at the same time, do so seeing things as they really are. Not better than they are, not worse than they are, but as they are. And that means understanding that exploitative dynamics do exist, they are commonplace, and that it would be a good idea to understand them, to see them, and to know how to recover from them. Because we've all got to recover from them at some point. It's just part of the human journey. It's a rite of passage. With that all said, that is what this episode is about. So we're going to be talking about exit and recovery. So I want to just recap briefly the five phases of codependency, which I discussed in the last episode. So feel free to check that out if you would like a more detailed description. But they are in short, the attraction phase, the bliss phase, the conflict phase, the clash phase and the recovery phase. So whether we have become involved with an individual who is narcissistic or it's a, an employer who is exploiting us and our good nature or indeed society at large, right? There's usually a process that involves in these five phases. And I find these five quite useful because they describe what's going on in your own mind. Like they're not talking about merely what manipulators are doing, such as the traditional you know, three stages of abuse model, which talks about uh, idealization, um, what is it, discarding, oh, devaluation, then discarding. That's useful, but it talks more about like the tactics used by abusers as opposed to what is going on inside our own mind. And so the five phases of codependency give us a model to work with to find our bearings and to understand what we can do to take responsibility and to gain insight through this process. And you know, something that's occurred to me this week, or at least um, been on my mind, is that we talk about shadow work. We talk about integrating our oppressed aspects and that we, in some ways, attract our shadow. It's true, but in one sense, the reason we might be attracting people who are not behaving honestly and are abusive and have maybe even made entire careers out of creating illusions, right? And manipulating people and having to kind of, you know, move on from, from each place because after a while people kind of cotton on 
to what this person's doing. They have to sort of you know, uproot and find a new group to, to leech off. Well, sometimes the reason we don't see them is not because we have repressed our inner swindler per se, right? But because we aren't conscious of our own propensity for dishonesty or because we project our own goodness onto other people. And, you know, we assume that when they say something to be true, well, because we would not tell a lie, that they must not be telling a lie. So yes, there's responsibility. There always is. But it's not to say that we are bad or that there's any judgment involved. And it's certainly not to say that it's because you have you know, repressed them in you. Right? Sometimes we think of shadow work in these terms. And we think of it in quite a sort of qualitative way where we actually give names to personality traits that other people have that we find displeasing and that we've repressed in ourselves. But what I think is that at its core, we do not repress qualities. It's not quite an accurate description of like the mechanics of what's going on in the, in the mind. What is hidden and what is unseen, and for want of a better word, repressed, is feeling. Right? And that is more, yes, of course, feeling has a, a quality. But you can also think of it in terms of quantity. It's kind of like more like an energy, right? And yes, feelings exist in, in different qualities uh, as well. And we then call them emotion, right? We give them a concept. But these are all just words, right? Ultimately, feeling is an experience trying to be experienced, trying to become conscious. And so what's really repressed is not a word, a label, a quality per se, so much as it is a feeling, an unresolved feeling. And our experiences in the world by and large, just point us back to the feeling. So it may not be that we have you know, repressed our inner manipulator so much as there is a feeling that has been exerted on the mind and has gone into the unconscious, has not been experienced and is trying to become conscious at some point. And so our unconscious mind, some way or another, which is almost beyond the conscious mind's comprehension, has put us face to face with a situation which includes a person perhaps or a group of people that is trying to compel this feeling to become conscious. And there can be a combination of feelings, of course, so it can get quite complex. But sometimes like, you know, thinking about it just gets in the way and it's important just to lie back and experience what is trying to be experienced. Uh, face up to feeling, right? Those four words can be very powerful, right? As a little mantra to carry around, to bear in mind. I mean, there aren't many panaceas in, on the spiritual path. But if there was one, you know, it might be face up to feeling. And of course, the caveat here is that the words themselves don't, don't actually do much. It's what you actually do as a result of bearing those words in mind, which is the work. That is where the work is done. So. Went off on a slight tangent there, but let's uh, bring it back. The five phases, and by the way, you can start planning an exit at any time during these five phases. But in reality, during the attraction phase, this initial magnetic attraction where things just seem to be going really well, and, and then into the bliss phase where you just feel like you've really made it and you found this new purpose through this group or this job or perhaps with this individual and you're planning you know, this fantastic future together. And you're unaware of any conflicts that are going on. So it's unlikely you'd start playing an exit at that time. In fact, it's almost by definition impossible. You may start to think of it at the conflict phase, which is when little conflicts arise where it's like instances occur that simply don't match your model of this person or this group. And you happen to try and reconcile those conflicts. And for a while, the mind might have tried various techniques to do that. It might have rationalized, justified, denied, various things. But at some point, especially if you're honest with yourself, which if you're listening to this, you, you probably are someone who is willing to take responsibility, you're going to notice these conflicts and you're going to try and resolve them skillfully sooner or later. And one way or another, that then leads to a clash because this inner conflict must be resolved in a real world situation. So ideally, you'd start planning your exit before that happens naturally because it's going to happen. But 
the moment you start planning an exit is the moment you become proactive. Now, before you say, ah, you know, what about the option of remaining with this person? That's a really important point because I'm not saying that the moment there's a conflict with another individual or a group that you must start planning an exit. That's absolutely not what I'm saying. Here's the key. We're talking about the five phases of codependency, okay? And if you look at my definition of codependency, which I've just discussed in previous episodes, it's where the individuals are not taking responsibility themselves. So they're unconsciously using each other as a way to regulate unresolved feeling that they themselves aren't willing to go near. So this is the, the narcissist's modus operandi, basically, right? It's, it's use other people to regulate something that I simply cannot go near. Because if I went near it, it would just be just an explosion of painful feeling. Like it would be like asking someone to dunk their hand in a pot of boiling water for 30 seconds. So like, no matter how much money you paid them to do it, they're going to have a hard time doing it, right? Except in the case of a narcissist facing up to their feeling, it would actually be a beneficial thing for them. But uh, you know, unlike putting your hand in boiling water. But the reality is the pain is what prevents them, right? They just aren't willing to go near those feelings. And so rather than engage in true connection, they must seek out narcissistic supply, like what merely looks like connection on the surface and admiration and validation and attention. So we're not demonizing anyone here. We're not saying these people are bad or wrong. There is a case that through their own free will, they've contributed to the, their state of mind they've put themselves in these situations and their circumstances haven't exactly helped them with that their early year uh, upbringing for example this is not to make a uh, a moral case for who's responsible for that really personally i think asking who's responsible is a bit of a peculiar question in truth like we are all responsible for our own mind or we can take responsibility for our own mind and we can choose to start doing that at any time. So regardless of you know, previous situations, we can always take that responsibility for the mind. And not least, actually, we need to do that because it is the foundation of spiritual growth. Unless there is responsibility, a willingness to look at one's own mind and why we find certain things challenging, why we're addicted to certain things or thoughts and why we're averse to others, we need to really deeply understand that about ourselves in order to make any progress along the path of spiritual growth. So here's the thing. This is not about just abandoning any relationship when there's conflict, because there's always going to be conflict. It is about making a discernment based on observable phenomena between relationships with people who are taking responsibility for their mind and are willing to and to continue doing that versus relationships with people who are not willing to take responsibility for their mind and at the extreme end of that you have narcissists psychopaths and so on for anyone to argue that any relationship must be worked on has to also make the case as to why pursuing a relationship with a demonstrable psychopath is also worth doing so don't be afraid to discern to be able to say okay this is not a relationship that's going to work because there isn't responsibility happening both ways. As long as you are taking responsibility, and that is the, the primary thing here, like you must practice that in order to be capable of making such a discernment. Until a person is taking responsibility for their mind, repeatedly and habitually, and really like coming to know themselves through that act, they won't reliably be able to judge the character of others. I don't mean judges in you know, labeling. I mean judges in understanding, deciding based on observation. Until you've got that, that standing point, it won't be possible because you'd just be projecting. There'll be no movement. And by taking responsibility for one's own mind, you can see the shortfalls in both. You know, everyone has issues that aren't conscious. Everyone has an unconscious mind. It's not a mistake. It's actually a very wonderful thing. But there is a qualitative difference between taking responsibility and not taking responsibility. And it's really important to bear in mind uh, on the individuation journey because without that, we're just labeling, trying to make you know, 
specification for how we think best to do things. And we're back to the one side of the approaches of, oh, just be kind. Oh, don't be kind. No, that person's bad. Oh, you know, it just it just becomes a a sloppy mess um, where we're just trying to sort of shoehorn ourselves into a you know a difficult, challenging reality rather than working with it as it is and moving and changing with it. So the exit and recovery process then. So let's just you know, start with this as the assumption that you are interested in learning about how to exit and recover from an abusive relationship. The reality is never as straightforward as merely walking out, right? And this is one of the myths of people who join cults is that, well, you know, you know, it's a cult now. Why don't you just leave, right? Of course, there are many reasons why it's not as simple as flicking a switch. So just as you have submitted substantial energy to this relationship through the attraction and the bliss phases and subsequent phases, there's a kind of inertia to that. And even though you might realize that it's an abusive situation, that you're being exploited, that does not mean that the moment you recognize that intellectually, that you can simply flick a switch and move on. If you feel like it's possible to do that, then it's likely there hasn't been any genuine transformation going on and that actually you're not facing up to feeling. And if you're not facing up to feeling, you're not growing. So it, also bear in mind that just as you have sub committed substantial energy, narcissists also depend on the utility and supply provided by others. So knowingly or not, you have probably been acting as a kind of narcissistic supply for this person. Right? I mean, you may have been going through the motions of working a job and you may have been genuinely doing useful work and getting paid by by the clients of the company and this kind of thing. But what was the real reason the boss wanted you to work there? Was it really to complete you know, this report for this client? Or was it so that they can walk around and be the boss, right? And be like, hey, look at me, I've got a company. I've got you know, an office in London. <laughs> I've got people working for me. Uh, you know, don't underestimate the, the value that narcissists, including cult leaders, place on that supply. And even though you might feel like you have a quite a a two-way relationship where you know, there's mutual respect both ways, you know, that can actually break down pretty quickly, you know, or at least the appearance of it can dissolve pretty quickly the moment that narcissistic supply is questioned and the narcissist is forced to choose between actually connecting with you, actually working in your interests and looking for a win-win versus merely looking like it, acting like that's what's going on. So do not underestimate the motivation of a narcissist to hang on to you, to hang on to what you give to them. Right? They're not going to make it easy for you to leave. That's okay. We're ready for that. We've got tactics and solutions and strategies for that. So don't you worry. But nonetheless, this experience occurred for certain reasons, which must be examined. Right? Insight and facing up to feeling are required for a complete recovery. All right, so it's not especially helpful just to say, oh, well, you know, I guess I got unlucky. I guess that's just how the workplace is in the 21st century, or at least, uh, you know, in the, the last couple of decades. You know, there, there are reasons why you ended up with that person or in that group or in that office with that company. And they must be examined. This is really valuable work and very much worth giving your time and attention to. Okay, so we're going to talk now about the five ties, or otherwise known as the five dangers. And these kind of comprise, yes, the reasons why it's not as simple as just flicking a switch and leaving once you discover that you're being exploited, but also the very ways in which harm can actually be done to us if we engage in relationships that are exploitative. And they're quite simply physical, financial, legal, emotional, and spiritual. So they can be divided into outer dangers and inner dangers. And they're fairly self-explanatory, right? So physical danger, physical harm of any kind, this may be the gross kind of violence that comes to mind, but it's not necessarily. So physical ties can also be a lot more subtle, right? They can be where, for example, you feel like you have to wear the right kinds of clothes at this place or with this person. 
or that you know this this partner doesn't approve of your facial hair or something right or doesn't approve of you not having facial hair or this kind of thing and what can be postured as you know just looking out for you or trying to be the right way to get the job done can actually be a subtle form of control so you know physical danger doesn't have to be physical violence it can be things that are a lot more subtle it can be to do with your location like where you have to be right financial tie is pretty clear so if someone's trying to get you to get a mortgage with them for example and they're actually untrustworthy this would be financial danger or entering into some kind of um, business ag- arrangement or say like you know the cult leader wants to use your personal bank account to take like book sales right to take like revenue from book sales or something this would be financial danger not least actually legal danger so there's an overlap here as well and legal danger can be anything like that where you're getting into legal contract with this person thinking that their intentions are wholesome but really they're they're actually trying to like get one up on you take advantage of you in some way this can also include things like having access to certain accounts blocked or having your email address accessed and shut down so these can all be forms of legal danger where like your legal opportunities are inhibited because of the situation this person has deceptively drawn you into but those are all very much outer dangers and ties and what's often underappreciated are the inner dangers and the inner ties and they are emotional and spiritual When leaving a situation, it's important not to discount the emotional and the spiritual factors. And when it comes to spiritual danger, I tend to think that you can't really go that far wrong, right? And you can can go pretty far off track, don't get me wrong. But ultimately, as you make mistakes, it simply creates more pressure to learn and to correct. So... The fool who persists in his folly will become wise. Right? I think that's a quote by William Blake. And essentially, if you do make missteps and you do get involved with these people, eventually you're only going to learn from it. There will nonetheless be many situations in between where you just feel like this was in no way a good decision. This is just a loss, like you've lost something or you're never going to have something. And of course, these interactions will change the course of your life but there's always a flip side so it's also not to negate the fact that these people invariably are trying to get you to project your own ideals onto them whether it's the ideal woman or the ideal man right so the animal or the animus or in the case of a spiritual cult it might be the sage or the hero often the leaders of also commercial cults or digital marketing cults like They want to be seen as the hero and they want you to feel inspired around them. But of course, this comes at the cost of integrating your own inner hero. And often the longer you know these people, the less the reality matches the image and the more instances there are, the more data there are where you go, okay, there's the reality and there's actually the, the perfect image that exists inside me. And, you know, these experiences can actually be necessary as a way to really integrate that archetypal content. So this actually goes back to what I was saying at the start, where if you're someone who apparently never encounters these types, right, and never has joined a cult of any kind, has never been in an abusive relationship of any kind, is that necessarily pointing to your unsurpassed wisdom? Or is that pointing to the fact that you're refusing to integrate these aspects of yourselves? And are actually relying on interaction with other people as a way to experience them. So even though it all comes good in the end, the narcissists, of course, they don't realize this. They're not really fans of the unconscious mind. And they are working overtime to try and manipulate you through emotional and spiritual means. I mean, ultimately, it's futile, but there you go. (laughs) Right. So as I've said here, the inner ties run deeper than the outer. Their impact is often underestimated by people leaving abusive situations and those looking to help them. This is really important as well. So if we find ourselves in a position to help people who have left a codependent dynamic or an exploitative cult, 
it's important to bear in mind that many of the ties are emotional and spiritual and that the mind is going to take time to catch up. And a lot of the, the real work of leaving is psychological and there's feelings to be worked through. And until those feelings are worked through, the intellect is going to be doing all kinds of funny things, right? So we have to bear that in mind. It's not as simple as just you know, fixing the physical situation or the legal situation or the financial situation. The real work is psychological and the outer reflection is really a result of that. So if we try to resolve the outer situation, the legalities, the finances, without taking responsibility for our mind, then we will not truly be moving in the direction of recovery. We cannot just shift the world about. We have to be looking at our own mind, coming to insight. So this is certainly a way in which my content tends to differ from much of what you might uh, watch on YouTube about narcissism, for example. A lot of that stuff is really good, I find. I mean, like Les Carter, you know, I think, you know, great stuff, great channel, super deep knowledge. And it's a really important part of recovery, I think, right? That understanding of narcissism, like really coming to intellectually grasp, like what is it that I've encountered here? Yeah, that's really important, but it is just one piece of the puzzle and it's a much bigger puzzle. It's important to really see narcissism, to understand it, but also to reflect on how it comes about, why it exists, and not just understand it, but also accept it, to really come to terms with its existence. And maybe even come to see that it actually, in a kind of perverse way serves a sort of purpose in the world. That's not to say that we should encourage it or that we should become it, absolutely not, but that it exists almost by consequence of our own need to, to integrate something. So this is not about just pushing these people away in our mind. I mean, obviously we're not going to be pursuing relationships with these, these broken people, but that's, that's not to say that we should demonize them or just label them as bad and you know, cast them out into the desert as though we'll solve all our own problems in doing that. So just as your involvement with this situation, this person was a very heady experience at the start, probably an all-consuming experience from start to finish. Well, likewise, recovery, at least for a, a limited period of time, really ought to be considered a full-time job. You probably possibly have a job as well, another full-time job, but really there's nothing more important than your mind. And you can kind of do this work at work. If that makes sense. You can do that by practicing the seven habits as you go about your work. You know, making sure that you are taking responsibility for your mind. You're practicing wholesome intentions, like kindness, compassion, not pushing people away, staying in tune with the unconscious mind. And of course, practicing skillful communication. So speaking what is true, speaking what is purposeful, speaking what is kind. Like these things will all help with your recovery from exploitation. So just as the relationship at one point may have permeated most, if not all aspects of your life, recovery from exploitation requires a commensurate level of attention for a period. So there are no quick fixes to this. There's no quick fix to any kind of transformation in life, but there is a fix. In fact, it's a guaranteed fix. There's no gambling here. The recovery is inextricable, provided that one does the work. So I tend to think of recovery in three parts or three phases. The first is planning your exit. Typically, this will occur during the relationship, during the situation. And will often occur at the conflict phase or the clash phase, as I said. But actually, even if the clash has been forced upon you and you've exited, you've been forced out through some way or another, maybe it was your choice because the situation was just becoming unbearably dangerous. Maybe there was some critical danger that just had to be avoided. Or maybe the other person discarded you in some way, right? Whatever it is, it's still worth it to work through an exit plan as I'm about to describe for you here. The second element would be to gain insight. So 
Yes, this includes gaining insight into the other person, also into the situation, but predominantly it really means gaining insight into yourself. Now, what led you to the situation? Understanding the sequence of events, which you can map against the five phases of codependency, which can be a very useful exercise. And understanding what you needed to integrate as part of that. And you know, it's really important to walk that middle way between understanding yourself, but not blaming yourself. And likewise, not holding the other person entirely responsible for your situation, but at the same time, being able to see them clearly. So this is, in my opinion, like one of the mm, shortfalls of the way shadow work is often practiced is that it's actually quite one-sided because it it tends to look merely at oneself, which is actually quite refreshing, actually, <laughs> frankly, compared to you know the the more common way of doing it in society, which is just to sort of, you know, try and fix the world, including other people and kind of compulsively get other people and things to do what we want and blame them when our mind isn't peaceful. Of course, the flip reverse 180 degree opposite of that is, oh, I'm just, you know, this is all me, right? <laughs> and actually the great irony is that if we take that approach, we're just going to keep encountering these types, okay? We're just going to keep encountering abusers until we get the lesson that you know what, there is such a thing as evil. And yes, it's my own mind that has facilitated my encounters with it. But there is evil and it exists for a reason and it's not to be excused. Okay, it's actually to be integrated in yourself and worked with as it is. And it's actually only through doing that that humankind can really stand a chance to regulate its own evil. Because evil always arises from something not being seen. It always arises from an addiction to something that looks like what the true self really needs but chases some kind of surrogate so in the case of abusers and narcissists right they really need love and connection but they don't actually want to go there because it's painful for them so there's this conflict and to placate the conflict they seek you to provide them with validation and that keeps them nicely placated for a while but it's uh it requires constant energy to keep it going so insight is vital the third though i refer to as finding a new way or finding a new model for navigating life now depending on how involved you were with this person and how much of your personal sovereignty you gave up to them there may be quite a job to do here in finding a new way of perceiving and operating in the world like if you've become very heavily involved in a corporation or a kind of exploitative cult of some kind it's possible that you know they would have taught you things that have helped you to navigate your experience day to day that you start to see the world in terms of what this group or this company is teaching and it's only normal that that would be the case right and you start to make decisions based on the values of those groups. Now, of course, if the the real value underpinning this group and its boss or its leader's doctrine is that they get to be the savior that everyone else projects their own inner savior onto, then obviously these modes of perceiving and operating in the world are going to be pretty corrupt. So it's, it's going to be necessary to find a new model. And that can be an intellectual process as well it's about understanding it's about really starting to like build on your intellectual knowledge of reality but there's certainly an emotional component to that as there always is and in my case i have the the seven habits of individuation are a model that i use for navigating life and it's really the the middle way it's really the series of habits that allows you to walk the middle way in your own life you know, so it's not saying thou shalt not steal, but it's saying here are the principles of what it means to live without conflict. And so they're not rules to be followed, but they're habits to be practiced that you can incorporate into your own life in a way that works for you. So there's kind of an inherent flexibility in the model. So when it comes to planning your exit, then this is the first of those three elements. If possible, be proactive. Ideally, during the conflict phase. It's not really possible to do it any earlier because you're not conscious of any conflicts. So why would you be planning an exit? 
But once the conflict phase has occurred, then here's the thing. You've determined that this person is actually not interested in taking responsibility for their mind and they are never going to be interested because their whole philosophy of life is about manipulating the world to suit their preferences. You know, they may have even come up with some philosophy around how doing the very things they're doing is un unadvisable and that no one should be doing this. No one should be trying to just merely fix the world. Of course, completely misdirecting away from the fact that that is what they are doing themselves. <laughs> so you know, it, it can be quite tricky to see this for what it is sometimes because there's all this deception being employed. But you know, you, you have to ask if like if someone is really making a point like really firmly about why this and this and this are really important, you kind of have to wonder why are they, you know, so intent on teaching us about generosity, for example. Like, is it really from a place of generosity that they're teaching that? Okay. So the clash phase will occur regardless. So it's best to be proactive, it's best to be the one that is instigating it, because it cannot be avoided. You can only go through it. And this doesn't mean you must have a clash with a person. It just means that there is a, a conflict in your own mind which is going to play out at some point. Like you cannot suppress it forever. It's going to manifest. So it's therefore a skill and it's on you to bring that about in a way that is managed as much as it can be and is most conducive to your personal growth. It's almost certain that a narcissist will be secretly prepared for this. So even though they might be acting like they're really in this with you and you know, they're really committed to you and you know with you to the end, behind the scenes, really, you know, they've been through this kind of thing many times before and they've decided not to truly transform from it. So they're actually ready to take many actions behind the scenes. And actually, when you start making your concerns known, it can be quite sobering to see what they actually then do as a result. And all these you know, things they've got planned behind the scenes, suddenly they're pushing buttons and they're taking action. So just bear that in mind. In a healthy functional relationship, sharing concerns at appropriate times is vital. But with an abuser, such appropriate moments are few and far between. Right, so you know, should you really be telling the Gestapo where you live or where you plan to be for the next two weeks. Right? And if they're sending you letters saying, you know what, it really would be wholesome if you shared your concerns with us and actually told us where you plan to be because you know, that's the, the honest thing to do. Don't fall for it, right? This is not about honesty. This is about understanding the intentions of others and not being fooled yourself right? about what the real reasons are why they want to know this stuff. So you're under no obligation to share anything about your concerns at a time that is inappropriate for you. I'm, of course, an advocate for always being not least honest, but upfront and straightforward. And you can still be honest, upfront and straightforward whilst skillfully choosing what not to share with a narcissist. Those things can absolutely both exist together. Now, if you are not proactive in leaving, of course, this does create extra challenges, but these can still be overcome. So, you know, if the cat is out the bag, so to speak, and the narcissist knows what you're up to, they know that you're leaving, they know that you've decided firmly, yeah, that can make things difficult, but it generally is still worth completing an exit plan in the way I'm about to describe as the situation is unfolding, because it can make you understand the strengths, the weaknesses, the opportunities, the threats, and it can help you check that you haven't missed anything. And also just make sure you've covered all bases so that you can't be flanked in an unexpected way. So as I just alluded to, I recommend completing a SWOT analysis for each of the five dangers. This is essentially what the exit plan consists of. So you can actually literally go through this list here. You can take all five of the dangers and you can look at the strengths, the weaknesses, the opportunities and the threats pertaining to each one. So, for example, let's talk about, say you're leaving a digital marketing cult, okay? You've joined this group. You thought it was just a wholesome community of like-minded people. 
you know, innocently learning online marketing skills. And, you know, the real intention of the group was very carefully concealed from you throughout the first week or two of your interactions. But as time has gone on, you start to realize that actually this is basically an MLM scheme, right? And they're actually trying to get you to you know, spend your money on Google ads to sell their product, right? And you get some kind of kickback from people you bring in. And, you know, what was initially postured as a digital marketing education program under the hood really just turned out to be an MLM cult with the primary purpose of serving the fantasies of the leaders, right? And their self-image. Well, let's just say that's all the case. You know, you've spent a lot of money on the marketing. You spent a lot of money on the course. Financially, it's likely that this group is a lot stronger than you are, right? As just an individual. They're likely to have a lot more financial weight that they can use if any challenges should come up between you. You know, they've got a lot more financial power. But let's not deny the opportunities here because even though, say, there might be a opportunity by staying with them right, and making the revenue, actually there's an opportunity in leaving. There's an opportunity in what you could make if you chose to abandon that unwholesome choice of partnering with someone who is using deception as a core characteristic of their way of working, right? So is the money really worth making if you know that on some level you're really just making it by continuing their work in the world, right? You're really kind of endorsing their work. So there's a threat, arguably, in losing that money, making a financial loss from leaving this organization. But there's also an opportunity in what will come from the growth you experience after working through the recovery process and what you then choose to go and do afterwards. So you can start applying this SWOT model to all five of these dangers. You can be thinking about you know, the strengths you have as a character versus the people you might be involved in. Like you can really help to understand Myers-Briggs, for example, like really understand personality types and the cognitive functions and like understand the ways in which these people are operating fundamentally. And that also then gives you insight into their, their weaknesses. Knowing those weaknesses can be very helpful in at least doing what you need to do for exiting and recovering. So even with all the planning in the world, right, do not expect leaving to be easy or without surprise challenges. Expect the unexpected when breaking away from a narcissist, okay? Yeah, they've, they've no doubt got all these secret little options They've probably been gathering data on you both behind the scenes and in your open, honest conversations, which you've had with them, right, under the guise of it being for you know, your benefit somehow. They've been collecting data. So even though you might have done an analysis on, on all the, the dangers that might occur, expect there to be more. They've most likely planned for this well in advance, whether generically or specifically for you. And they are likely to employ layer upon layer of actions intended to trap you physically and psychologically at every turn. And of course, the way they react when they finally realize that you're intent on leaving, this should simply affirm what you already know about their state of mind and their true intentions, right? So you know, in their wisdom, they think that trying to force you back into the, the loop, trying to employ undue influence, trying to whether it's writing slanderous things about you, whether it's trying to pull the wool over your eyes and deceive you into coming back into the fold. All this does is prove to you that your reasons for leaving are sound, right? But you know, in their mind, because they associate the mere image of attention or the mere validation and admiration with the genuine thing that it represents, right? The thing they really need. And they can't discern between the two. They have to get that narcissistic supply because they're not willing to go near the unresolved feeling and actually genuinely connect with people. So, you know, they haven't allowed themselves to move beyond that and realize that getting someone to give you attention is not the same as love. So this should only serve to fuel your resolve to move on, but do not underestimate the extent 
of narcissistic rage, right? And the, the lengths they will go to. Yeah, they haven't got empathy. They're not practicing empathy. You know, whether we want to think of that in the traditional sense of being willing to feel what others are feeling or have compassion for other people, genuine compassion, not just talking about it. Or whether we think of that in a psycho-spiritual sense of you know, the willingness to be transformed by our experience. That's not something they're willing to go near. And it helps to bear that in mind when dealing with these people, like understanding that your well-being is simply not a factor in their decision-making at all, other than as a means to serve what they really want, which is narcissistic supply and the gratification of that self-image. So if there's, let's say, two healthy people, right, they might have 100% compassion for each other. A dysfunctional relationship might have 50%. Uh, a typical workplace might have 25%. A narcissist doesn't even have five. They don't even have one. They don't even have 0 0.001, right? They have zero consideration of your well-being. It's not even a factor. And if you're not aware of this phenomenon, it can be quite discombobulating when you see one enter the state of narcissistic rage. It's like you are, from their point of view, the thing that has caused their feelings to, to re-emerge. Of course, those feelings were always due to re-emerge. Um, it's not your fault <laughs> that has happened. Uh, but um, as far as they're concerned, you know you have threatened their persona and must be dealt with as a matter of life and death. So bear in mind that narcissists primarily deal in illusions and fear. And the path of action that you most fear taking, or moreover, the path they most want you to fear taking, is precisely the path that will lead to your freedom, whilst disarming them at the same time. So this is quite common in spiritual cults, like religious abuse. They want you to fear leaving, right? Whatever the fear might be, it might be an incalculable number of rebirths, it might be hell, right? It could be any of these things. It could be that you'll go mad. It could be that, you know, this group is the only thing that can really help you and that you'll be lost without them. Well, of course, if they were genuinely interested in your spiritual growth, they would be saying, you know what? You should face those fears. You should, you should try and see what happens if you face those fears because it's the ego that fears anything, right? It's the ego that experiences fear and therefore it's the ego that is trying to drag us back into this group, this you know, comfortable community of ever so nice people that merely serves as a uh, like a medicine for doing the real work of making the unconscious conscious it's not the real thing so heading towards the fears entering the cave you dare to enter that is how you will attain true freedom that is the siddhartha road right that is how you truly uh come to realize yourself in doing so you'll disarm any abuser at the same time, you will no longer be capable of being exploited in any way. So the second element of recovery is about gaining insight. And that means gaining insight into yourself and the unconscious content that led to your involvement in the relationship. And so when we talk about facing up to feeling and coming to insight, these are really like two parts of the same process. They're really two sides of the same coin. Coming to understand something intellectually can point us to the feeling that needs to be experienced. And likewise, experiencing the feeling makes us ever more capable of understanding, articulating, being able to really pinpoint to ourselves and to others what exactly happened and why. So facing up to feeling and coming to insight, these are really you know, two parts of the same thing. It's also helpful, as I mentioned, to come to understand the workings of narcissism and maybe doing this specifically, maybe reflecting on a particular individual, right? And, you know, their history and reflecting on that, maybe even learning more about it if that's possible or necessary. And in cult recovery, 
in fact, in any situation where there's been an exchange of ideas or ways of life, like the way you should be behaving, it can be really helpful to understand the ways in which the doctrine was corrupt. So this can take some work, like piecing apart the teachings, trying to understand where they made sense, where they didn't, and you know maybe taking away what was useful, but setting aside what wasn't. Because no doctrine is the absolute truth. Right? The absolute truth is not something that can be put into words, right? It's the truth is not found in a book. It cannot be because they're just labels and ideas. You can use it to point to an experience and realize truth in experience, but you can't reduce it to a doctrine. And I think this is a really important point, right? A textbook narcissist is actually quite rare. In fact, I don't think I've ever met someone that I would consider to be a textbook narcissist. The vast majority of narcissists do not fit the stereotype. They certainly fit the definition. So once you understand what narcissism is, then you can spot these people. Even when you encounter them in an entirely new and idiosyncratic way, you'll still be able to know what's going on. And it comes down to empathy. It comes down to that willingness to transform that I mentioned. Because you, know, you can feign compassion. You can fake emotion. Right? You can fake the appearance of compassion. And therefore, you can kind of fake you know, the conventional understanding of empathy. But true empathy cannot be faked. You cannot re reliably and consistently fake transformation, the willingness to be transformed by your experience. So if you understand that that is really what defines a narcissist is that they've shut down any willingness to be transformed in whatever way that might show up. So once you really understand it in that way, you'll be able to spot these people. But a textbook narcissist, I'm not even sure they exist. So if you felt like you know, the one that you knew was different, the one that you knew was really like, wow, no one like that has ever existed before. Well, yeah, of course, because they're an individual, but they're not going to be like any other narcissist. Like, you know, some are subtle, some are very coarse and grandiose. Some grandiose narcissists are also subtle. Right? You know, there's some odd nuances here, but it's the nature of this projection, this process of participation mystique, right? Where we are seeing something ideal in another person, whether it's the ideal woman, the ideal man, or the Christ figure, or the, the father figure. You know, because of that projection, this real life physical person is perfectly capable of appearing as something special and different. And that is simply the mind projecting this inner ideal onto them. So if you feel like your narcissist was different in some way, you're not alone. <laughs> okay, so here's the thing. True love is unambiguous. It does not need to be justified and it does not lead to rage when expectations are not met. So three really important qualities of true love to bear in mind, right? It's unambiguous. When someone really loves you, you know it. They don't even need to say it. It's just evident. It's completely unambiguous. It does not need to be justified. You know, it, it, it doesn't come coupled with statements like, oh, well, I'm only doing it because I love you. Right? I'm only doing this really suspect and ambiguous and morally suspicious thing because I love you, right? Even if that were true, it's still them talking down to you as though they think they've deemed themselves as you know, someone who needs to teach you how to be. And lastly, true love does not lead to rage when expectations are not met. Right? I was only trying to help. I was like, well, okay, if you're trying to help, <laughs> then why are you being rageful? <laughs> so you know, this is what occurs when a narcissist is forced to show their hand and it's like were they genuinely interested in my well-being or were they interested in narcissistic supply with the appearance of caring as the means of achieving that as a deliberate act of deception bait and switch 
Now, true love does not lead to rage because it doesn't have expectations. Yeah, it's not making that love contingent on that person regulating our own unresolved emotions. Moving on. So, so psychotherapy is helpful, I think, and can actually sometimes be vital in recovery. But by itself, it may not be enough to facilitate a full recovery. I mean, firstly, we talked about how recovery is a full-time job. And that means it's not really something you can just partition to in a, an hour a week or two hours a week, like you know, going for a run or something. It's something we do day to day, moment to moment. It permeates the decisions we make all the time. But furthermore, many therapists are not trained or experienced in narcissistic control dynamics. Maybe they don't understand the nuances. Maybe they haven't had personal encounters. And maybe they're still looking for that elusive textbook narcissist. And therefore, it's quite hard for them to really identify on your behalf what's going on with this person. And not least say to you, yeah, I think you've encountered a narcissist there. They're probably unlikely to do that unless they're really skilled. But to take it one further, even fewer are familiar with the workings of exploitative cults, not least just religious cults. What about corporate cults? What about uh, commercial cults? What about self-help cults? These are all cults, right? These are all exploitative groups. And even if they are, they're possibly not familiar in a way that is specific enough to your experience. Because these experiences are all so different, so idiosyncratic that it could be very difficult to find a therapist that is tailored enough to your specific situation. Now, any therapist can help you, right? Any good trained therapist, even without cult experience, can still form a vital part of the recovery process, can be very helpful to help with that emotional processing. But I think it's helpful to consider it in combination with other things as well. One thing that can be useful is to speak with other people who have previously left that cult you know this is something that uh, Stephen Hassan encourages is that if you're thinking of leaving a cult speak to people who have already left that cult understand why they left when it comes to gaining insight one technique that I certainly recommend is shadow work and you know shadow work is really about coming to encounter the repressed aspects of yourself and as I discussed earlier Yes, you can think of this in terms of the qualities that we've repressed, personality traits, but at their core, it's really about feeling. It's really feeling or the unwillingness to feel something that keeps us trapped in a certain way of operating. And so Jungian shadow work comprises a range of techniques that can help a person in abuse recovery to uncover deep aspects of the psyche that attracted them to the situation. And shadow work explores questions such as what storylines and messages did I acquire at a young age on which I have been unconsciously operating? So you know, often we encounter these situations because they sort of represent situations we've been in before or the people involved, as much as they may be wildly different from other people we've known, there is something familiar about it there is something that they are bringing out and they might be a wildly different personality they might be a completely different person completely different background but what's consistent is the feeling that they draw out of us that's really what's driving the encounter and where that's unconscious that will find a way to create situations that encourage us to face those feelings so another question is, what was the benefit that I was getting on an unconscious level? So unless there was a benefit to being this person or being in this group, of course we wouldn't have joined. Now, they know this, right? These groups, they deliberately tap into those unconscious drivers and offer something that likewise looks like the thing we need isn't the real thing. but from our point of view, it really helps understand what were those benefits? What were the perceived benefits? And what was the real unconscious benefit that was driving it? 
equally important, what exactly was the fear that I was unconsciously avoiding? In fact, this is intrinsically related to the question about benefits. Because more often than not, you know, the, the perceived benefit is actually a way of avoiding a fear. And it's really often the avoidance of a fear that drives us into these situations. Like maybe there's a, a really deep-rooted fear about being financially insecure, for example. And that can show up in a number of ways, right? It may be that actually we are financially secure, but because there's that deep-rooted fear, it's not been made conscious, we find ourselves dating people, marrying people, partnering with people who seem to allay that fear of financial insecurity. Now, that's not to say that you shouldn't seek those people out, but it's to say that if the reason you're seeking them out is because of an unconscious fear, then you're not truly free. And that's going to be impacting the quality of your decisions. So another question here, what persona have I been upholding in order to avoid the associated painful feelings? So let's take an example, a commercial cult, because they sell this image of success. And there's a kind of superiority in that, right? It's like, we're really successful. We're doing really wonderful things not like these normal people over here, right? So if part of us has become attached to you know, an image of ourselves that is, okay, I'm quite successful, I'm really intelligent, or I'm really you know, well off and you know, I can make things happen and look how strong I am and this kind of thing. Well, we're going to be attracted to people and groups that on one hand normalize that persona and at the same time offer that image to us. So we then become attracted to it. But really important here, what shadow aspects have I been repressing? So let's follow on with that example. If we're really attracted to what merely looks like financial success, then maybe in the shadow, we've got the poor person, right? Or the, the person who's no good of money or the hobo, right? The homeless person or whatever. Well, of course, that is not who we are, as it were. But if we are chasing what merely looks like financial security and impulsively grasping after, you know, these superficial relationships that seem to offer it, then sooner or later, we're going to cheat on the real thing. We fall in love with the symbol and the real thing is going to be tossed aside. And at that point, we're going to have to make a choice between, okay, do we want to look financially successful or do we want to do the things that are actually going to lead to financial security. Because often doing it and looking it are incompatible. So moving into the third element of recovery here, and I refer to this as finding a new way. As this is really about arriving at a new model of understanding, finding a new way of being in the world, and living without conflict. So this third element answers the question, what next? So the experience would have brought about many valuable lessons, not least from the challenges you encountered. But invariably, the person or the group will have had some redeeming qualities as well. Like We're not saying that anyone's bad here or anyone is like all bad. Even the people who do the most evil things, who have repressed their empathy to oblivion, there's still things we can learn from these people. And finding a new way is in part about untangling that a little bit, like dissociating the person and the immorality of their behavior from aspects of them which may actually be useful to us. And this is a bit similar to, to shadow work, really, because it's about saying, you know, don't throw the baby out of the bathwater. If we try to avoid being like them entirely, then we may actually throw out some of the virtues as well. So if you're leaving a cult, it is worth doing some extra work to untangle what was useful from the doctrine, from the corrupt material that was really just there because it was intended to manipulate, and then retaining what was valuable in some form. Anything that does not serve to make the unconscious conscious can be safely thrown out. So if the emphasis is on creating good karma, right, and just being a certain way all the time, then this is not a doctrine that understands the 
the nuances of the individuation journey. And it's about finding the middle. I mean, naturally it wouldn't because it's a cult doctrine. And the idea of the unconscious mind is not something that's considered really or appreciated by cults and their leaders. Because implicit in that would be an understanding of projection and that actually none of this is is real <laughs> and we're all just playing a game of grown up make believe right but individuation requires that we make the unconscious conscious so that we can integrate it in ourselves and so we're not reacting impulsively from a place of unresolved feeling so whatever you choose to do as a way to ground yourself in a new model it's necessary that you make the unconscious conscious that is the path of spiritual growth and it can help to find new people sure it can help to do a lot of reading help to really get your head around it but just bear in mind that you've left this situation that's been so compelling for a while and has then compounded to the point of being a creating a great conflict for you in life it's not necessarily going to be easy to just dive overboard and expect everything to just work out from there on in best to you know, set yourself up on a new island where you can actually build on solid foundations and reclaim your sovereignty rather than just finding a new rule book start to understand yourself understand what you need to understand to navigate your life that is it so moving on there's a place for taking action and there's a place for rising above and I did allude to this earlier in that there are perhaps two schools of thought or two extremes. At one end, we might have the conventional mainstream narcissism channel on YouTube, right? Talking about how evil narcissists are and I don't necessarily disagree, but it's very much a, a, an emphasis on taking action. I mean, I've even seen some of these channels actually endorsing deceptive behavior by return now clearly that's not going to produce good results in the long term it doesn't lead to understanding it doesn't lead to elimination of internal conflict it just makes more conflict which will of course result in clashes right in life and then at the other extreme we might have almost denial right like just not engaging with the reality of narcissism at all and uh, oh it's all a projection well yeah kinda and we might maybe even get involved in spiritual bypassing or pass it off as like oh this person had a difficult upbringing or something like this and it sounds wonderful doesn't it it sounds really peaceful and lovely but it doesn't actually face up to feeling it doesn't actually engage with the reality it just bypasses it and so there is a place for taking action and there's a place for rising above it may well be that you actually have to take some action in order to resolve the issue in yourself and in the world. If you just try to move on, just put it behind you, but don't actually do the work to face the feeling and to ultimately, you know, maybe deal with this person their karma. Because it could be that they're creating this tension, they're creating this energetic necessity, right, to be dealt back to them at some point. And maybe the tension you feel is actually karma doing its work. Right? It is actually the imbalance compelling you to bring things back to balance. So taking some form of action that's wholesome, that practices skillful communication, it's honest, right? It's upfront, but it's not malicious, okay? So it's, it's true, it's useful, and it's kind, but it does nonetheless say what you see. That can be very beneficial for your recovery and you may even see that do benefit in the world, right? As people start consuming what you've produced. But then if we then identify with that and then make that our life and our habit, we then start to use action as a kind of coping mechanism. And if we're doing that, we're not actually getting over the issue. We ourselves are also avoiding that feeling. So the middle way is the one that faces up to feeling and the two extremes are ones that avoid feeling. But once we've done what we need to do, we can then rise above. And that means integrating what we need to integrate and seeing the situation clearly. So on this topic of finding a new way, I'm going to talk briefly about 
the seven habits of individuation, which is this modality that I've conceived of. And the inspiration for this has really come from several places. It's come from people I've known, people I would consider to be highly integrated, sage-like people who have really stepped into themselves. And these are psychologists, coaches, dentists, right? These are people from all walks of life, artists, and they are few and far between these people. I'm just grateful to have known a fair few of them. So I've taken on board a lot of their advice and also their examples and incorporated that here. Another source of inspiration for this was simply my reading of the various spiritual traditions and teachings, and in particular Buddhism. You know, I have studied Buddhism for a while, but also Christianity and also Hinduism, and just understanding some of the core principles of these traditions. And lastly, it's really come from my own spiritual practice and the understanding of the unconscious mind. So I've put this into practice. I've experienced the results in my own mind. And it's what I do every day. And as part of that, I've tried to, in fact, I've been forced really to understand not just what works, but why it works. Because you know, when I came out of a, a spiritual cult, like some of it was benefiting me and some of it wasn't benefiting me. And I had to really understand like why the things that were beneficial worked and why the things that weren't, weren't. And that eventually led me to depth psychology and particularly Jung. So I really came to understand spiritual growth as the process of making the unconscious conscious. No religion will think of it in those terms because they're thinking really in terms of the, the symbols that pertain to their religion and whether it's God or Jesus or whoever, or what the book says. Of course, like some of those things are useful because they help to integrate the mind. They help to make a person more conscious. But much of what they teach doesn't do that. So really that's that's how I came at these seven habits. And they can be divided into three cornerstones. There's the understanding component, the conduct component, and the mental discipline component. And look at any religious or spiritual tradition, generally they will include teachings pertaining to those three cornerstones. They might emphasize some over others, like for example, you know, meditation is a really big part of Buddhism, whereas in Christianity, the equivalent would be prayer. But I would probably hazard a guess that the average Christian probably prays less than the average Buddhist meditates. I don't know that, but that's just, uh, seems pretty clear from what I've observed at least. So the seven habits in brief, I'll just read them out. They are habit one, take responsibility for your mind. Habit two, cultivate wholesome intentions. Habit three, skillful communication. Habit four, contribute your unique and specific value. Habit five, manage your state. Habit six, mindfulness all day, every day. And habit seven, meditate daily. So this isn't really the time and place to go into great depth in all of those. But I just wanted to run that past you briefly because it's very relevant to this final piece of recovery from exploitation, which is to find a new way or to arrive at a new model of operating in the world that consists of understanding, like grounding yourself in experience, means taking responsibility and cultivating those wholesome intentions. Like if, you, if you just do that, you might find the rest just falls into place. Right? If you're really honestly taking responsibility for your own mind and cultivating those wholesome intentions to look into your own mind, to let go of what isn't useful and your cravings and addictions, and to stop pushing people away and to love and to cultivate that compassion and sympathetic joy, to some extent, the rest of the habits kind of fall into place and they do build on them. So skillful communication is really about speaking what is true, useful, and kind. And you know, meditation is really where we bring it all together. But meditation can be any kind of active and dedicated mental discipline. For some people that's prayer. For some people that's active imagination. Personally, I think there is tremendous benefit in really committing to, at least for a time, deep meditation. Like if you were to take a year or two of your life, as I did, and 
devote it predominantly to spiritual practice, including hours of meditation every day, then your mind will be transformed. And you know, I think the, the work you do in that time will mostly always be with you. Like even if you don't continue meditating for two hours a day, the fact that you did do that for quite some time has exposed you to something that will serve you for as long as you live. So I think even though not everyone has to meditate that long every day, personally, I do still meditate every day, although not for two hours, and I still find it useful. But the fact that I had that time to really go deep with it has helped me find the middle going forward. It's helped me to find, yes, what is the right amount, but also helped me to understand what it was I needed to understand about the mind and to find that that place of you know real peace and to really see things clearly there. Like even if you go back into day life and you have challenges and you have stresses and you, know, you suffer, I think the fact that you've gone there changes the nature of your suffering permanently. Like you can be in the depths of some really painful feeling, but on some level you still know not to take it seriously. So if there was one thing I could recommend to all people, oh, I could have to be hard to choose one thing. Uh, it'd probably be take responsibility for your mind. But uh, other, other than that, it would be just get one to 2,000 hours of meditation practice under your belt and try that out. If you decide after that amount of time that that was a complete waste of time, which I don't think you will, but at least from the outset you know that's not really significantly going to change the course of your life that much, right? You can do an hour or so a day for uh, a few years or half an hour a day for a few years and you haven't really lost much as it were. You've actually gained a huge amount, but you know, from the outset, it helps to know that the commitment's not that huge, but the potential payoff is enormous. So I would recommend doing that. I think that's probably enough said for today's episode. So I'm going to leave that there. Next week's episode is going to be about spiritual leadership. So I'm uh, interested to maybe move on from some of these uh, topics of difficulty and strife and into something a bit more um, uplifting. But that next episode, episode 10, is intended to be the final episode in this series. So if you value what I'm doing here, I would appreciate a like, I would appreciate a comment or even a subscribe. And, you know, let me know what you think. If you don't like it, that's totally cool. But I would appreciate it if you just let me know what you don't like about it and maybe, you know, give me some constructive feedback and um, I'll take it on board. So I'll leave that there. Hope that was useful and I shall speak to you next time.